Well, good morning. It's so good to be with all of you. Thank you for being here. David, welcome to God's family at this particular place. Thank you for choosing this congregation. We're very thankful for you. It's been good to get to know you over the past several weeks since you've moved down. And uh, as I've said with others and truly mean it, we can't wait to serve God with you. We can't wait to serve God right next to you. In church, it's always good to be reminded when someone chooses congregation in this day and age. It speaks very highly of the atmosphere and the culture that we want to build among one another. That of what the Spirit produces, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The things that there are, there is no law in heaven or on earth that could be made against things like that and so much more. And you are to be commended for making that as a unified purpose and a unified goal. And I hope that as a congregation that we will continue to do that. That we will continue to put a high premium on the things that God has put a premium on. Those elements and so much more. And I know that we are working together and serving together. And I am very, very thankful to be with you this morning. To all of our guests, we want to say thank you for being here. We want you to know as a church how encouraging you are to us uh, by being here and giving some of your time. And we pray and we hope that your time with us will be encouraging to you. It will be uplifting to you. And that if there's anything you hear, if there's anything that you see that elicits any question, I know that you can ask any member of, uh, that's a part of this congregation. We'll be more than happy to talk with you about any of those things. And if it's just a simple prayer request is all that you have, we would consider it an honor and a privilege to pray with you and to pray for you as well. But I'm very thankful that everybody is here. Last week we started this series of lessons that's going to take us through the next several months as God allows on unity. Now a couple of weeks ago in, in speaking about the house rules, if you will, and the things that we want to live by as a congregation one of the statements that we made was that God does want unity among his people, but he does not want uniformity. He does not want us wearing the same thing and looking the same way and marching to the same beat. There are things that we need to study, things that we need to read within scripture, and we may draw different conclusions. And that's all right. That's part of studying to show yourself approved. But make no mistake, when we say that, there are things that God has revealed within his word that we must agree. There are things that he has laid out, things that he has revealed, that we don't get an option. If we are to follow him, then these are the things that we must believe. We started last week with the very word itself that you're holding in your hand, whether it's a hard copy whether it's in electronic form on a tablet or phone, we started with the Word of God. And not just the Word of God in general, but specifics concerning it. Things that we must agree. Is it authoritative? Is it inspired? Is it how we gain our insight into the Father? Is it how we gain our insight into God and His plan of salvation? His plan for you and for me. If we are married, then our plan, His plan for our marriage. If we have children, then His plan for us as we parent. Those children, and the list can just go on and on and on and on. But that among God's people, there must be an, an agreement that the very thing that we're holding in our hands is His Word. It's full of truth, it's full of light, and it comes from Him. And it is the main way in which He has revealed Himself to us. And even last Sunday night, we talked about how God preserved, even with the scarcity of writing materials and writing utensils that existed within the first century and the years prior to it, how God preserved that word so that you could have it today and I could have it today. So that we could build our life not just on it, but we could live according to it. To be reminded in a very season of change, that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. And that we agree on that. But the word of God doesn't exist just so that we can say that it exists. It doesn't even exist just so that we can, we can just have it in our hands and maybe thump it a little bit. There are things that it reveals. Starting with God. Now I know that we look at our day and age and we look at our, our society and we're 
we're fairly sophisticated. Modern medicine has lengthened our years on this earth. Life expectancy is as high as it ever has been, at least for us, on this side of the world. You can pull out your phone again and you can instantaneously communicate to anyone, anytime, anywhere, day or night. And it keeps you connected. We can get into this thing called a car and turn it. And it takes us wherever we want to go. There are so many things that bring sophistication in our life. And I know that all of us are thankful for them. But did you know that our day and age in, in the Western world, that there's a question that if you just go believe beneath the surface a little bit, beneath just making money, having a career, raising kids, having certain types of goals, all of those are good. But if you go beneath that surface... That there's a question that we're asking today that was asked back in the first century and that was asked even further then by ancient Israel. That is, which God is out there? Which one? Now, I know we look at it and we would think again in the Western world we kind of educated ourselves out of this. These are myths. These are superstitions. These are stories. These are maybe great things that make for a good bedtime story if we wanted to. But is there anything out there? And of course, the, the answer would be of it is because we all worship something. We all give our time and our attention. We all give our heart and our focus. We all give it to something, whether it's in our day and age, whether it's money, whether it's technology, whether it's an academic pursuit, an athletic pursuit, whether, again, it's making a career or whatever, we, we all worship something. We all give ourselves over to something bigger than ourselves. The first century did it. And even in the ancient Near East, during the time of Israel, they did it too. And the question then is the question that we're trying to answer is, which God? Which one is it? Is it the one of pleasure? Is it the one that's self-seeking? Is it the one that gives me security? Is it the one that provides comfort? Which God, which God is it? In the second part of our lesson this morning, out of this series of lessons, we turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6 where the Apostle Paul answers, this question, which one? And he explains to the church at Ephesus that against the backdrop of one of the wonders, the seven wonders of the ancient world, a temple to Diana, banking center of the Roman world, at least of the Asian province, very powerful, very influential. And against the backdrop of that temple, and we'll talk about that more tonight if you want to learn more about it and how this fits into this, the context of that day and that age. But there's something that the church proclaims, and it proclaimed it then in the city of Ephesus in the early 50s of the first century, and it, it proclaims it now. One God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. We must agree. That out of all the so-called so gods that exist in our day and age, and there are many, we must agree there is one God. And that's not unique to Christianity. Israel heard these words prior to her crossing over the Jordan River into a promised land that was inundated with seven different nations and full of idolatry. And it would be something that she would steep her her roots in, she would ground herself in and she would ground each and every generation that would come after. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God, one. When we proclaim as a congregation, when we bring ourselves to full agreement that there is one God, we are not revealing something that the world has never known, we are just picking up the baton of the people who have come before us. We agree that there is one 
God. But who is he? Who is he? What statue would you point to? To say, there he is. What, what picture or painting on a wall would you say, that, I know that's him. What piece of evidence would you put forth and say to somebody, this is him. How can we agree on this one God? If maybe even among us, we're not sure who he is. So with all of that said, we turn to Acts chapter 17 and we find the Apostle Paul entering into the city of Athens. He's by himself and he's waiting for his traveling companions to come. So I imagine that he's taking a tour of the city and it's a city in an area of Rome that's, that's a lot like ours. It's a very educated area, very affluent area. People are very sophisticated with how they live. They're very sophisticated in how they talk, how they make decisions. It, as a matter of fact, Athens was second in influence only to Rome itself. And Paul looks around and the text says that he's just provoked with what he sees. And he, he pays them a compliment and says, we notice that you're very religious. And see all kinds of idols, see all kinds of statues, all kinds of altars. And he just perceive that you are very religious. Which is one of the myths of our day. That as much as we may see numbers rising and statistics rising as people who are moving away from God. If you just take a survey of American uh, of Americans, we are very religious. We just may not be God-oriented, as we would say. But we are religious. We spend our time and we spend our money on things that bring us joy and that bring us pleasure. Nothing wrong with it. But we are very religious if you define religion to a certain extent. So Paul begins, and he starts to answer our question. And you know what's interesting about the Bible, is that it never comes out and tells you here's a book and here's a chapter and here's a few verses that make a case for the existence of God. You know what it does? It just says He is. It doesn't make a case for Him. Not that we shouldn't make a case, but it just says, in the beginning, God. It doesn't try to disprove all the others. It doesn't try to go out of its way to say that it's foolishness to believe in them. It doesn't try to go out of its way to say it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of effort. It just simply takes God, the Bible does, and it puts him right in the middle of human history, actually sets him right where we could see him, and says, why don't you just take him under consideration? Survey your landscape, survey your society, survey what, even what you're doing individually, and then here's God, and then just make a consideration. Make a thought. And come to a conclusion. Now don't come to a conclusion on your own. Don't trust in yourself. Because if we do. We're always going to reach our conclusion. 100% of the time. And as a side note. If we find ourselves agreeing with God. Or God agreeing with us. I should say 100% of the time. It's probably not the God of the Bible. If we find ourselves. Having a God who always agrees with me who always sees things the way that I see them, who would walk the path that I would walk, that's not Yahweh. And we're going to see how that is. So Paul answers the question in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, as he looks at this altar and he finds a place that he can latch onto and, and try to reason with them and try to open them up and again, get them to consider this unknown God. And he says, this unknown God that you worship, and by the way, don't you find it fascinating that he doesn't condone or condemn their worship? He just kind of leaves it alone. It is what it is. He just simply says, the God who made the world and everything in it. Who is this God? He's the God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth. And the two things that he says about this God is that he is the creator of everything that you see. And I know that it's, it's easy to tune this out because it's elementary to us. 
But I want you to think back on this last week, and I want you to think about how you lived your life. Did you live your life knowing that you were part of the created order and everything in it? Or did you live your life as something separate from that? Did I live my life knowing that I was created? Did I make decisions? Do we as a congregation, do we recognize and know that we are the, create, the created? Not the creator, we are endowed with creativity. There are things that we can do and that we can produce. But church, we are not God. There is one creator. And he created everything. And that's the story that we agree to. And that, that this nature, that this creation reflects him. And it shows harmony, it shows peace, it shows unity, it shows order. It shows so many things that we can see just to the naked eye. But here's the thing that Paul does, and he just kind of slides it in. And it's so important because we're going to bring this up at the end of his sermon and at the end of this one. Not only is he the creator, though, he is sovereign, Lord of heaven and earth. Is he sovereign in your life today? Who rules the roost? Is he sovereign? Is he just one among many? Is your job sovereign? Is your family sovereign? Is money sovereign? Is technology sovereign? Who is Lord of your heaven and who is Lord of your earth? Who is Lord of your family? Who is Lord of the decisions that you make? Who is Lord of the goals that you set? Who is Lord? If the curtain be, could be pulled back, who is Lord? If we recognize that we are created, then we have to recognize among, among each other, He is Lord and I am not. And yet it's fascinating to see, even though we would maybe proclaim his praises and we do so among one another, maybe how little of sovereignty he has within our life. What's so amazing about Jesus on his life for three and a half years is that he had no problem whatsoever in acknowledging who was sovereign even over him. No problem whatsoever in acknowledging that there's the Father, and there's me. And that I am here to accomplish His will. To live my life His way. To make every decision under His rule. And the question for me and the question for all of us in terms of unity. Is does the church recognize and does the church reflect the sovereignty of the Lord? Do we reflect and acknowledge being Lord of heaven and earth, and that Lord is not sitting in a chair this morning. That that Lord is not here doing just anything, but He is in heaven, and we are in His presence at this very moment. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. But it's not just that. I love what Paul does in Ephesians 4, that He's not just God, though. Did you notice that He says that He is also Father? Which means that before we get into this portion of the sermon, and we're going to have to do a little bit of work. And that's this. For a lot of us, we have a very negative connotation of the word Father. No doubt, past experiences, things that we wish were not in our minds about earthly fathers. Perhaps you had a good one. Perhaps you had a bad one. But God as Father is not like any that you have ever experienced. And the work that we have to, to accomplish is to not take those experiences and overlay them on the Father of heaven and earth. My Father was quick-tempered, someone would say. But the heavenly father is not quick. My father was a hard man. 
But the Heavenly Father is not a hard entity. I didn't really have anything in common with my father. Maybe I didn't even know my father. And for that, I'm sorry. But this congregation wants you to know your heavenly father. And in the middle of this sermon, Paul takes a turn. And he moves away from creator. And he moves away from sovereign. Not that they're not true. Not that they don't matter. We need to hear that. We need to know that to the core who we are. But he moves away to something else. And it's not necessarily moving away as much as maybe turning a page and showing us another side of this guy. And he's a father. Whether people acknowledge it or not, he's a father. Whether people acknowledge him as God and creator and sovereign, he's a father. Whether they worship him in ignorance or they worship him out of intentionality, he is father. And Paul provides this evidence of this. Because if we were to ask what makes a good father, at the top of the list or near the top of the list would be provision. Right? A provider. Notice what he provides. God himself, Paul says, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In him, he says, quoting a poet, we live and move. And have our being. Like what Todd had to say with his version. We exist. We're living in a day and an age. Of identity crisis. This is why our unity in one God. And one father above them all matters so much. Because we know our identity. And my identity and your identity. And our identity to collective is not, a, is not letters on a sign. It's not a task that we perform. It is that we live and move and have our being in the one God of us all. And that regardless of whether we acknowledged it or not, whether we live our life in gratefulness or not, He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So I want you to put your hand on your chest for a moment. And I want you to breathe in and out. He just gave you life. He did. And yet, when was the last time we stopped outside of a doctor's office to breathe in deeply like that? Life. There's so much that happens throughout the week that we think that it just puts life in jeopardy. If I don't, if I don't get this done, who or what am I? If, I? if I don't meet the quota, fill in the blank. And put your hand on your chest and breathe in and out. And it wasn't just God who gave that. Life and breath and everything. And when we're willing to agree, come to the agreement that there is one God and that there's one Father, there is something that we're willing to admit out in the open, whether individually or collectively, and that is this. We are utterly dependent on this Father, and that's a good thing. In a time and a day and an age where the God of independence and self-sufficiency is highlighted and it becomes one of the highest virtues that I can do it. And I put my hand on my chest and I realize He's the one that gives me the ability to just simply inhale and exhale. And that identity is found in a father who didn't look at me and say, did you earn your next breath? Let's talk about that for a moment. We're studying with a lady, a Bible study, Tom and Sue, Lafon and a few, of, a few others of us. She's on an oxygen tank. 
just got to pay to have it refilled. Any of you that have ever had it or seen somebody, you got to pay for it. You got to earn whatever the money is to pay for it. When you just took that breath and I just took that breath, there was no coin that we deposited to earn that breath from this father of ours. Think about how amazing that is. But he doesn't just simply want to be the father in terms of a physical component. Paul looks at these Athenian philosophers, these well-educated, well-read men and women, just like so many of us. And he says there's something greater and something deeper that he wants for us and with us. More than just simply inhaling and exhaling and having life and breath and everything from a physical uh, aspect of life. There's something that God wants for every human being. He wanted it then and he wants it now. That mankind should seek God. Perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. There are a lot of people who are looking. They may not know they're looking, but they're looking. And the church exists on the basis of unity to reveal and lift up, not ourselves, not ourselves, but to lift him up and say, here, that very breath that you just drew in, maybe without even thinking twice about that very breath, that God who gave that, he also wants more for you. He also wants more with you. He also wants to have something with you. He wants you to seek and he wants you to look, perhaps even find him. And then there's something that he says that's so amazing that he is not far away. And yet, how many of us struggled this week with the feeling that God was far away? And he's as close as the next breath that we just took. That this is his desire for you and for me. And the church has got to ask her question. Is that our desire for the world? That the world perhaps would come and feel their way and find them. And can we be an instrument that brings people to the Lord instead of taking them away? Can we be the bridge that connects one side to the other? Can we be the ones, are we willing to be the ones to do that? And the answer is unequivocally yes, because that's his plan. And he wants our unity to be the concrete in which the bridge is made. So who knows God because of me? Who knows God because of us and the unity that we have? That there is one God and Father of us all who is in all and through all. That this is our task and, and there is no greater task on this earth to have that. What an amazing thing for all of us about this one God and this one Father. Which brings us to a close brings us to a close remember how we mentioned that God is creator and that he is sovereign there's one verse that speaks of God being God and father all at the same time it's hard to imagine God being outside of time isn't it we're just bound by time beginnings and endings whether it's we rise when the sun rises or we get up earlier because our alarm went off we go to bed when the sun goes down or we just go to bed when the time tells us to go to bed. God is outside of time. And he is so powerful that the one thing that we have to live our life according to, he does not. Everybody here has to live according to time. And it's precious and it's fleeting. But God is so powerful and God is so strong and God is so big and he is sovereign over time itself that the scripture tells us that at some point he has fixed a day that as creator and as sovereign, he will judge the world in righteousness and justice. But there's something that the father does not want to happen on that day. He does not want anybody to perish on that day. Whenever that day is. Instead, the goodness of the Father comes out in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he's appointed a day, he says, 
but you will judge the world in righteousness. And we know it will all come to an end, he says. Because so long ago there was a point in time where a man lived, a man died, and a man was resurrected. And he has given that assurance to us all. What does the Father want today? He wants you to come and find Him. But He wants you to come looking for Him because He hasn't done anything. This Jesus tells us that this Father didn't wait for us to come look. He came. How much does the Father desire to give us not just physical life, breathing in and out, but spiritual life that lasts now and forever. So much so that he gave his son, his only son. That is why there's one God and one Father. Because out of all the gods that exist now, and out of all the gods that have ever existed, there is only one who is willing to die for you. And he didn't die because he was angry. He didn't die because he was jaded. It was because he loves you. And we love you too. And if you're ready to know this one God, if you're ready to know this one God as one Father, we want to encourage you to take the action today. Whether that is to believe and be baptized and have your sin washed away, or just simply start the journey that would bring you there. Whatever it may be. We agree. That there is one God. And that there is one Father. Why don't you come as we stand and sing.